Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Our guest today is Mac Shine, a neuroscientist from the University of Sydney. Mac has dedicated his career to understanding the intricate dance of neurons in the brain and how their coordinated activity shapes our cognition, attention, and perception. He also happens to have aphantasia. In this talk, Mac will share his thoughts on his own experience with aphantasia and discuss some of the intricate, intriguing ways our brains might give rise to the condition. For anyone new to our live events, you can use the YouTube live chat to post your questions and we'll get to them after his presentation during the Q&A portion. So with that said, Mac, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Tom, great uh, to be here. Excellent, okay, so uh, I will add your presentation to the screen here. You'll have about a half an hour and uh, I'll see you shortly after that. Great, thanks. All right. All right, everyone. Well, great to be here. Um, uh, I heard from Tom recently uh, after we had put a paper online uh, that included the word aphantasia, and it was uh, really exciting for me to uh, have a discussion with other people that have uh, this particular interesting quirk in their brain. And uh, as, as a neuroscientist, I often like to sit and think about what it is about my brain that makes it a little bit different and a lot of the other people I speak to. And so hopefully today I can tell you a little bit about my experience, you know, what it's been like learning uh, that I have aphantasia and then thinking about uh, some of the different studies that we've done in my group, as well as thinking about the broader experience of neuroscience, trying to understand this really, really difficult problem, how the brain works. Um, you know, we like to pick easy problems when we're uh, picking our careers, um, but trying to figure out how we can use advances in neuroscience and things like neuroimaging, which is what I usually use in my day-to-day, -day, to understand how it is that uh, our brains are a little bit different from the general population. So I love to show this photo. Oftentimes when you look at the at the Earth at night, there'll be flyovers, flyovers of the, um, the International Space Station. It's always flying over Europe or, or North America or something. But, you know, don't forget there's also beautiful continents down in the Southern Hemisphere. So I, I live uh, around here. I uh, work at the University of Sydney. I live a little further north on the coast than the University of Sydney, but really beautiful part of the world uh, if you're ever interested in joining. Uh, and I work at, at the University of Sydney. So this is a, a picture of a little quadrangle here at, um, at the University of Sydney. Uh, you can notice the beautiful blue sky because uh, we do a lot of blue sky science where we try to think about how it is that the brain works. How can we take the complexity of the brain, all the details of the neurons and their interconnections? There's you know, literally billions of neurons in your brain with trillions of connections between them. This is an incredibly big, difficult puzzle to solve. And amongst a massive network of neuroscientists that are really distributed across the globe, we're working together to try to understand how it is that it works. How can we think about the coordinated activity? How does the particular pattern of coordination give rise to something like our ability to see the world around us, to imagine the world around us? And then what goes wrong when uh, individuals like us with aphantasia, I'm assuming lots of you online have aphantasia as well, what is it about our brains that works a little differently? So um, as Tom mentioned at the start, I'm an aphantasic neuroscientist. And um, for a long time, I really thought I was the only one, but I, I've, I've recently come across a number of other neuroscientists and, and engineers uh, that have uh, aphantasia. And it's actually, a, we all share very similar experiences, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. But I thought what I'd, what I'd do first um, as a bit of a flow, I'll give you a bit of a background uh, about you know where I, where I come from, what my studies have, have involved, just so you can get a feel for the kinds of work that I do. I'll then talk to you a little bit about how we think about visual perception and uh, some of the analogies that we use that aren't, aren't really all that reflective of the way that the brain actually sees the world around you. I'll then talk a little bit about imagination, so how it is that we drive our visual system in reverse. Uh, and imagination's uh, sort of extreme point of visual hallucinations, when we see things in the world that aren't actually there, um, it can be quite a problematic condition. And then I'll turn to, at the end to how we think a little bit about how we think how aphantasia uh, is actually showing up in the brain. But it, it'll be helpful to kind of go through this journey with me to sort of understand the background that you need to make sense of some of this complexity. And also just to give you an idea of the kinds of biases that we bring with us when we study from the perspective we come from. All right, so back in the early days of my training, I, I did a Bachelor of Science in, in uh, Biochemistry and Psychology at the University of Sydney. 
And that's a weird combination, but I was really attracted to the idea of this really ineffable thing, like a mind, attention, consciousness, awareness, uh, but also the fact that it was built from cells, uh, cells that have very particular biological rules, chemicals that pass in and out of synapses that cause neurons to fire. Somehow the coordinated action of, of all of those cells together gives rise to our ability to perceive the world around us. And I think this was really a, a starting point for me, but uh, obviously that's a huge gap between the cellular level explanation and the kinds of things that come up uh, when you talk about psychology, like mind and, and attention and consciousness. So needed to do some more study. So I actually went to medical school for uh, four years here at the University of Sydney as well, and then worked as a, a resident at, at the hospital, uh, at Concord Hospital in Sydney. Um, mostly what I remember from that is um, being really, really tired. And uh, it wasn't really all that much like scrubs. Uh, you know, there's coping mechanisms for, for making... <laughs> making fun so you can kind of keep your sanity through while working in a hospital, but it was very, very tiring work. Um, at the end of that though, I really had this itch still that I had been working on since I was in my undergraduate to try to figure out ways that I could help connect the cellular level and the psychological level. And so one, one uh, really uh, sort of um, important step that you can take in that direction is to conduct further studies. And so I, I did a PhD at the University of Sydney um, so I studied what are called the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's is a really complex neurodegenerative disorder where people uh, suffer from stiffness and slowness and tremor. Michael J. Fox is a quite a, a, a classic, um, famous example of an individual that we all know of that um, has suffered from Parkinson's. And it's quite a devastating disorder, in particular because it has these other really difficult symptoms uh, like hallucinations that I'll talk about later and um, inability to think properly, the memory becomes impaired, the sleep's abnormal, that we really want to understand better. And what I used as a technique to try to understand these was neuroimaging. So my little um, uh, Xerox of a hamburger is to give you the, the notion that we're taking this really, really complicated system of brain and try to understand it by looking at the, at the brain from the outside. And we use lots of computing to do this. So we use lots of different techniques and analyses, statistics and um, different frameworks try to look at the activity that we measure from a brain while they're having a particular symptom. And we try to understand what's going on in the brain. Um, but it's really abstract work, uh, which um, I think is, is just worth um, you know, pointing out at the outset. Um, after I finished my uh, PhD, I was awarded a, a fellowship to go over to the United States at Stanford in California. Uh, there I worked with a, a leading cognitive neuroscientist and really dove really down into the details of how to analyze brain network activity. So this, the idea here is that if someone lies down in a scanner and we measure their brain activity while they're doing some complicated task, what do we do with all of that data that we get? You know, we could just look at it. We could try to summarize it in really simple ways, or we could, we could try to find the, just the right way to look at it to give the kinds of insights we need to explain how it works. And so that was a really, really uh, eye-opening experience for me. Lots and lots of complexity, a really competitive environment. Um, and uh, right around the time at the end of my uh, fellowship, my wife and I made the choice to move back to Australia. Um, I was awarded another fellowship to work on um, more broadly taking those ideas that I'd learnt in, uh, in the US and bringing them back into that clinical world, trying to think about how these different patterns that we'd see in the brain while people were lying down doing a cognitive task, how do they become abnormal when people end up developing things like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or different forms of dementia? And if we fast forward a couple of years, I now run an interdisciplinary group of scientists uh, who come from all different parts. I have a couple of physicists in my group. I have one tennis expert, a really uh, a great violin player, um, and a number of other people. And the idea is that what we want to do is we want to make a melting pot of the different specializations that we need in order to understand this big, massive, complex problem of how to link the cells in our brain to, to psychology. And the kind of main parts of that melting pot, the main ingredients are the are details of the neurobiology. What that means is the types of cells and how they're connected together, the neuroimaging, how we can actually measure the system, and then models of the system, how we make uh, models like little toy models that we can build in computer um, programs that mimic the kinds of neuroimaging signatures we see with the kinds of uh, uh, constraints that you find when you look down at the brain. So that's the kind of work that we do. And I'm going to whip you back now to stage three. So stage three was when I was uh, doing my PhD and I was studying in Parkinson's and I was working on this particular disorder I mentioned where individuals with Parkinson's 
see things in the world that aren't there. So if they're walking around in their day to day, particularly as they advance in the stages of Parkinson's and they develop more and more pathology within their brain, uh, they start a, a subset of these people start to notice things that aren't there. And so the idea is that if they're walking around their garden, there might be a garden hose sitting in their garden, but because their brain isn't processing that information properly, instead of them uh, orienting their attention to that garden hose and looking at it closely and thinking, well, in my garden, I should expect to see a hose. A hose is a really common thing to see. They'll instead jump to conclusions and see uh, a snake instead. Their brain, in other words, will fill in the gaps and guess that what they're seeing is a snake and not a hose. Now, most of the time, this actually really isn't a big deal, but it can be really, really problematic because if you don't see the world as it is, but rather see the world as you expect it to be, you can have huge problems with your ability to cope in the everyday world. You know, this might not be problematic sometimes, but it can be really, really devastating. And we were talking about how this works and really uh, thinking about this in the group in the lab. And we were thinking about the fact that sometimes when you're actually, you know, lying down, cloud gazing, looking at the sky, you can actually make the clouds look like an image in your mind in a way, right? You don't actually change the clouds at all. The clouds are still hitting your retina, the, the little pixels on your retina, just the same way. But you imagine that one of the clouds looks like an elephant with its trunk in the air. And you imagine another one looks like a tiger about to pounce. Another one looks like a boat. And we wondered, I wonder if a, a little bit of what's going on in these people's brains is that they're imagining the world around them rather than just experiencing it. And when we thought about this, it's a really, really fun idea to, to click on because it, you, you immediately realize we don't really know how it is that we imagine the world around us. And in addition, the uh, extent to which we can do that and the extent to which doing that is the same across individuals is also really different. And this was the moment I realized it. I was talking with one of my colleagues and I mentioned to her that, uh, that my mental experience was a little bit like this. <laughs> if I tried to imagine the snake in the, in the garden, this is what would show up to me. If I tried to imagine uh, a purple dinosaur you know, rolling on a bowling ball uh, while juggling and, you know, um, clicking its fingers. I couldn't, this was my, my phenomenal experience. My experience of that with my eyes closed was black. In contrast, her experience was like this. <laughs> she was having this rich, vivid, vivid experience of, the, of her imagination. She could conjure particular images. She could describe them in exquisite detail. She could tell you exactly how she was experiencing it. For her, it was as if she was experiencing the world around her in a faded form. And to, uh, to me, I, I honestly, when I first heard this, just did not believe her. I, I believed that she was um, telling a lie or um, essentially making up uh, some uh, awful way of describing what it was that was happening to her that was fanciful. But now, the more I've talked to people now, I really believe that there is a, um, a really strong gradient between people that have the experience like I do, which I'm assuming lots of you have as well, and people like my colleague. This massive uh, spectrum between aphantasia and what we would call hyperphantasia, with a lot of people in the middle. And so this was my, my real um, kind of uh, real eye-opening for me, because for, for a long time, I'd really assumed that everyone was the same as me, that they had the same type of uh, brain experience that, that I did when I closed my eyes. And it was funny because my colleague was the exact opposite. She thought that everyone thought had exactly the same experience as her and thought that I was lying. So we had this really fun interaction. And this is actually quite common when you talk to neuroscientists and I'm sure uh, other, other individuals that have aphantasia. Um, so one of, the, one of the benefits that I think when I reflect on, on having aphantasia that, that I think is really important that I think maybe is a, a thing that I can use to my advantage in my, in my, in my career is that I, I'm really, really terrible at rote learning. Um, I can't just look at a list of words and then recall it easily, but I'm actually pretty good at um, taking things to a level where I understand them, right? When I have, I, I can knit them into the fabric of my understanding of the rest of the system, and then I can find my way back to them really easily. And so I think one of the things that my aphantasia um, has forced me to do is to think really carefully and work hard until I understand something, until I get it. And if I get it, now I'm fine. I can, I can essentially extrapolate from that. I can find new paths that other people might not need to get to because for them, they can just easily learn uh, a list of uh, words and then come back to that list later when they need it. Um, now, I think that's actually incredibly important for 
uh, problems that like we're trying to solve, like how the brain works, um, because it's such an incredibly you know, detailed, uh, in huge, massive system. And so if you just tried to learn all of the lists of words of how the brain works, you'd kind of be uh, on this endless quest. You wouldn't quite know where to, where to go, where to turn to connect things together. Whereas my Fantasia's forced me to essentially try to build knowledge and insight and wisdom into that um, uh, uh, experience from, from the get-go. Um, now, one word of caution, you need to be a bit careful because um, if you have the wrong facts that you're building into your network, you can quite easily extrapolate into uh, conspiracy theory. So you need to be a bit cautious with this approach. Um, but I think as long as you have a good fact-checking system, this approach can be really, really beneficial. Um, I also reflect on the fact that I think my aphantasia has given me quite a lot of mental resilience. Um, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the past and thinking about the times when things haven't worked out as well as they may have. And I think in, in my world, at least in academia, there's a lot of um, a lot of negative feedback that you receive. You get you write papers that get rejected. You apply for a grant that doesn't come quite out. Someone else puts uh, a paper in that was in an idea you wanted to work on just before you. There's lots of this negativity around. And I think my Fantasia allows me to kind of stroll through as you as you would with a bit of water off the duck's back. Um, but I think one negative uh, that I, I don't hear talked about a lot, but I think it does it really does come uh, come out to me, especially when I travel, is that I'm I'm really uh, really bad with my my memory uh, in terms of um, the ability to sit and 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 remember to to re-experience and reconnect with the people that really matter to me. So if I travel and I'm lying down to bed in in a hotel in some foreign country. Uh, it's really quite often you feel quite lonely because you you can't reimagine your your wife and 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 child's eyes and and think of their faces as you go to bed. You sit there with a feeling of them, but not really that rich experience. And I think that that's actually a negative that um, I try to um, get around by keeping photos on my phone and you know um, and uh, trying to sort of come up with these little um, externalizations of my memory or my capacity to imagine that that help me to have those experiences. All right, so so why we joined today uh, wasn't really to hear about my experience as a um, a dorky neuroscientist doing neuroimaging. Uh, it's to try to get a feel for what might be going on in our brains and when we have an experience uh, consistent with with aphantasia. Um, and so to do that, what I want to do is kind of walk you through, uh, you know, quite a bird's eye view. And if anyone has questions, please feel free. Uh, we can we can talk about this in the discussion, and I'm more than happy to unpack any of it later. Uh, but I want to give you a bit of a, a, a perspective, a flyover of, of how we've gone about trying to think about perception, imagination, hallucinations, and then afterwards what aphantasia might look like in that context. So this is a, a little a little diagram um, that we that we put together to try to kind of express what we think is going on, and it's it's worth worth double clicking on. There's going to be way too much detail here, so don't don't worry. But the idea is that um, your brain has this distributed set of of, of neurons, little cells that coordinate together into a massive network. And they have central processing stations, the little blotted do line, uh, blue dotted lines are called the thalamus. The outer surface of your brain is called the cortex. And the idea is that coordinated interactions between this network and within this network give rise to your ability to perceive the world. So on the left-hand side, um, if you, let me see if I can grab a pointer. Um, okay. So um, on the left-hand side here, if you're seeing an apple, the apple will hit your, the pixels will, they'll hit your retina. Um, the, sorry, the, um, the uh, electromagnetic um, waves will hit your retina. It'll pass the information on through your thalamus to your cortex. And then there'll be a bunch of processing in your cortex. And the idea is that you see the apple in front of you, but through that distributed network, you also make a number of different anticipations about what's there. You expect that the apple will have a crunch to it. Now, individuals with effective uh, capacity for imagination, without the apple present, can reinvigorate this network such that they have something like a weakened perception, visual perception of the image, and they also have all the information that would go with it. And the curious thing about aphantasia is that when we sit down to try to imagine the apple, we have no visual experience, but we still have access to some of that information. So the classic example that uh, people like Adam Zeman would use is if you walk into the front door of your of your house and you close your uh, you know with your eyes closed, imagine this: you walk around your house, how many windows are there in your house? Uh, most people with aphantasia are really quite capable of doing that. They can count the number of windows, but you don't experience walking around a house. And so it's a really interesting curiosity as to 
how it is that your network can still have information propagating in it, but you don't actually have this reinvigoration of the per perception. So to understand a little bit about how perception works, this is the kind of um, cartoon of the way that we typically think about how perception works. We have this eye, right? The eye is for sight and the, the light will hit the eye. And then there's this little brain back there that's doing some processing of the in input. But we really think of it a little bit like a camera. So, so here's the, the world as it is. There's, um, there's your eye taking in the, the electromagnetic waves that hit your eye from the world. Um, funnily enough, the bottom part of the world that you see actually projects to the top of your eye and the light from the uh, top part projects to the bottom. So if you were to imagine that the world was, uh, that the eye is a camera, it actually projects the world upside down to your brain. Um, and then the idea is that somehow in your brain, you've got this sort of magical world inversion device. You somehow flip it back around somewhere so that you can see the world as it appears to be. And so this is this intuition that the, the, the eye is really just like a camera. So I put it in an old, old tiny camera here. Um, but I'm gonna argue that we're using the wrong metaphor here. Um, that the, the way we think about vision is actually not like a camera. Um, it's actually perception and visual perception is much more like touching. It's much more active. So when we close our eyes and we touch things around us, let's say you touch the objects in the desk in front of you, you can, you can feel with your, your fingers, but you constantly move your fingers around. You don't just sit still and wait for something to, to touch you. You're constantly engaging in the world actively. And we actually do this all the time with visual perception. We flick our eyes around the world in these little movements called saccades, sampling the statistics of the world. And then from that, we gain an inference, which we call perception. And it turns out this is actually consistent with the known anatomy. It turns out that there are four times, possibly four times as many connections from within the brain back to the primary visual areas than there are from the retina to the brain itself. In other words, the brain has way more control over the inputs that come in than the inputs themselves. Suggesting that actually it's a, uh, this um, feedback and feed forward between the inputs that you receive and what you expect that really matters. So, so here's our, our better model of how visual perception works. Here's the world as it is hitting your retina. And here's the world as you expect it to be. Here's your particular model of the world, what you think will happen, who will walk through the door, you know, what you expect to see. And it's this trade-off between these two that really matters. And it's a constant active trade-off. You have to move in the world. You have to expect certain things for you to see them. So perception is an active process. Um, just to um, you know, really uh, hammer the point home, the idea is that as information comes in, it can feed forward through the network, but it's really the feedback expectations that matter for you to, for, for you to be conscious of the, of the um, item in front of you. Um, so the idea, let's allow, so just in little cartoon form, um, is uh, that you know you're sitting around in the world, you're imagining, um, you know, you're hungry. Let's say you want to think about how you're going to get some breakfast or your or some dinner, whatever time it is in the world for you. Um, your default mode network is this uh, big connection, a uh, big set of network uh, connections in your brain that is, let's say, mind wandering about uh, your breakfast or where you'd like to go on holiday, and then something really salient happens in the world around you. Some change happens. Someone walks through the door. Your visual network now receives that information. Um, your, your ventral attention network is another distributed set of uh, brain regions that can coordinate whether or not you mind wander, so it can shut that off, and then it can allow you to orient your attention back to this task and uh, to the talk and, and listen to me talk. So you have this really big, complicated set of networks that are constantly at play, guessing what will come next, helping you orient to the world around you or to your own thoughts. And we think that some of these things uh, go awry in, in disorders uh, like hallucinations. So, so uh, I have this little gif here to remind me that what we think is happening with imagination is that this process that I've been walking you through, this idea of expecting something to come into the world and then you see it, can actually be driven in reverse so that you can actually have really, really strong expectations with no inputs at all. And we think that this is a really good way to describe what's happening when you have an imagination and when that runs, runs awry, something like a hallucination. So you'll be well aware of, of these kinds of phenomena. The fancy Latin word is a pareidolia. Uh, it's when you see objects, often faces, in um, otherwise natural images. So here's a, a face smiling back at you in your cup of coffee. Here's a little toad looking at you again through a cup of coffee. Uh, and then here's you know the classic example of cl cloud gazing, seeing the horse galloping through the clouds. Um, and so um, a number of years ago, we developed a little task uh, to try to bring this out. We, we had people with Parkinson's that have hallucinations or at least self-describe them and a group that didn't. And we got them to look at a number of these images that have different interpretations. So you can see here the silhouette of the faces. 
And if you look at the black, it's a tree. So you can see that you can, there are two ways to see this image, whereas the image on the left, you can't, you can only just look at it the one way, it's just a candlestick. And we got people to look at these images and what we essentially found was that people with Parkinson's disease and hallucinations uh, were much, much better at spotting the, uh, the, uh, the deer here in the background as well as the foreground, but they would all, also often you know, find a boogeyman over on the side. So they were gonna misperceive images in these complex visual scenes. Um, and so we were able to relate that back to some of those brain networks that we talked about, and we could come up with stories about how the brain was um, you know, spending too much time imagining what was gonna happen and not enough time actually orienting to the external world and thinking about what was gonna happen, uh, what was actually happening. So we, you can actually drive your system in reverse in order to um, have a hallucination. So I'm gonna skip over some of these details because they're a little bit um, technical. Another really cool thing that you can do is you can actually use your imagination to bias your perception of the world. So this is this really neat task called a binocular rivalry task. So people put on these glasses where they can only see green images through the, um, the left, uh, for the right eye and red images through the left eye. And then you present them uh, this, uh, these horizontal gratings on the left and um, the vertical gratings on the right. And rather than seeing a weird mush, like a crosshatch of brown, what they actually experience is something like this. Their, eye, their perception switches back and forth between these different experiences of red and green. But the really cool thing, so this is, this is a really well-known phenomenon called binocular rivalry. You can do this yourself if you get the appropriate kit or go online and, and play around with these things. Um, it turns out that if you imagine ahead of time the color red, um, then the, when I actually show you this stimulus, you actually see red for quite some time before it switches back into the switch, the back and forth into the switching. So in other words, um, actually imagining the color red can kind of prime the red centers of your brain, the red visual centers. So you see red um, and you don't experience this normal switching. And it turns out that if you get people with hallucinations to do this task, they actually way better at this than, the, than people without the hallucinations. In other words, the ability to prime your system to essentially uh, run the system in reverse, to imagine the world the way that you want it to be and not the way that it actually is, is really deeply related to uh, hallucinations in Parkinson's disease. And, uh, and also related to these more distributed networks that I mentioned before. Um, I'll skip over this as well, but there's also some really cool links between your ability to mind wander um, this to, to, and, and hallucinations. So the way we get at this is that you, you see an image and then your job is to um, respond uh, with, you know, uh, what you think about with that image. And you can imagine your response might be, oh, the yellow circle reminds me of a yellow square. That's not particularly elaborate. Or it could be something like the yellow reminds me of a, a lemon pie that I had and I was in um, you know, South America and traveling around with some friends and a really elaborate response. And it turns out the more elaborate responses you have are actually associated with having a higher risk of hallucinations. So there's a deep link between your ability to imagine uh, and, your, and, and really um, run the system in reverse and your ability to kind of get lost in your thoughts, which I think is a really, really interesting link that we're, we're clicking on further. Um, so in the last few minutes, um, I'll, I'll come to what I think might be going on with aphantasia. So, um, we, we were very fortunate, uh, to interact with Adam Zeman, uh, who's sort of one of the preeminent experts in aphantasia in the world. And, um, in terms of the, it's, it's cognitive neuroscience, um, Adam, I, I understand has been on, on this, uh, this channel before and, and had discussions with you and. Adam actually had access and, uh, to a really, really cool data set, um, neuroimaging data set that we um, have, have now gotten our hands on. And the idea is they get um, a, a couple groups of people, both normal, uh, normally perceiving and imagining individuals, if that's our a control group, and then a group of individuals with self-reported aphantasia using the um, vividness, uh, visual vividness um, imagery questionnaire. And they have them perform two different tasks while they're lying in the scanner. The first task is look at a series of images and just push a button when you see an image. So this could be an image of faces or an image of different places, something really, really simple. And then in the second task, they're given a cue. I'd like you to imagine a place or imagine a face. And then they've given a, a set of time to do that. Um, and so the really key contrast for us is that we can take individuals with normal imagination and, that perform this, and we can say what's happening in their brain when they perceive item and then when they imagine it what's different and then we can also say 
what happens with an aphantasic uh, when they perform the perception task? This should happen pretty pretty regularly, uh, about as about as similar as to the individual with regular imagination. But in the imagination block, we can say what's changing in the aphantasic brain. What is it about the aphantasic network that's abnormal? Um, and so uh, we're still working on this data, but one of the really interesting things when we look at uh, the brains of individuals with aphantasia, and here what I'm plotting is how connected these different parts of the brain were to one another uh, over, uh, when you performed the imagination block as an aphantasic versus the perception block. Um, and what you see is that there's large networks in the temporal lobe, uh, also in the cingulate cortex and in the frontal cortex that are hyper-connected with one another, but areas in the parietal lobe that are, are less connected. So what that's suggesting, it's, it's um, early evidence that the network uh, of individuals with aphantasia um, is actually performing quite differently than individuals that have normal imagination. And we're still double clicking uh, on a lot of these results to try to figure out what it is exactly about the aphantasic brain that gives rise um, to, to these different, to our symptoms. But I would say that a really simple way to think about what we've done with all this high level thinking is that in aphantasia, we're not able to drive our brain in reverse. So um, we, you know, typically we see the world around us, that's riding forward. If an individual with hyperphantasia closes their eyes and imagines they're driving the system in reverse in aphantasia, we're not capable of doing that. But the question then becomes, why is it that I'm still able to do all the other things that I can do? Why is it I can still imagine the number of windows around my house while I, while I don't have that visual perception? And we have some really fun ideas uh, that we're working on now that relate to uh, the amount of information that you can encode in your brain. And there's some really tantalizing results suggesting that individuals with aphantasia aren't really capable of encoding as much information in their, uh, in their visual cortices. Uh, but that's that's probably a little bit too much for today's chat. I'm more than happy to double click on that if anyone would like in the question and answer. Um, another way that we're getting at this is to use uh, these really interesting new tools that are out there called large language models. And you may have come across these. ChatGPT is a really classic example. Um, the idea is that there are these little chatbots that you type in a question and they can give you a really elaborate answer. And people have been asking whether or not these these language models are, uh, are conscious because the kinds of answers that they can give back to you um, are extremely elaborate and rich and, and appear as though the machine is somehow conscious. But in a recent paper with Matthew Larkham and Yana Roo, uh, we've been arguing that the, the brain really isn't set up in the same way. So I mentioned before that, that you have this sort of really uh, um, interconnected network of regions with the central processing hubs that kind of share information with one another. This is really different to the way that a large language model works. It's just feeding information in, propagating through the network, and then giving you an output. It's really feed forward. So they have really, really different projections. Um, but also importantly for aphantasia, I think that the kinds of computations that these large language models are capable of are really very different than the kinds of computations that are happening in our brain, particularly for aphantasics. Um, but they're actually a little bit more like aphantasics, I think, than, than typical uh, imagining um, humans. Because the large language models, what they can do is they can give you access to information without necessarily perceiving it. And I think there's some actually really interesting ways that we can use large language models and compare them to the way that a, um, a healthy imagining brain might function. And we can ask how those, um, how those systems differ. So, so yes, LLMs are a little bit like us in the uh, aphantasics, but they're not really like a, a conscious um, organ, organism wandering around the world. So... That's a bit of a whirlwind, but hopefully it's led to some interesting questions in the Q&A. But what I want you to take away from today is that perception is an active process. It's your, your visual system isn't like a camera. It's more like the way you would touch the world around you, but with your eyes. The idea that imagination and hallucinations can occur when you drive that system in reverse, when you expect something to be there, that's not actually there. And that aphantasia occurs when you have an inability to drive the system in reverse but not completely, and we need to work on some of those subtleties. Why is it that, as an aphantasic, I can't make my visual system become active in the way that my imagining colleagues can, but I still have access to all the other information? And we think that's due to the complexity argument that we were mentioning before. And yes, it's still a massive ongoing process to understand the exact mechanisms at play, but hopefully I've given you some hope that we'll um, make some progress towards that outcome in the future. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.